My name is Charles Bernstein, and I'm with Pierre Joris. We're both in Brooklyn, though different parts of Brooklyn. And we're here as part of the reading of Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses. It's an international reading sponsored by the Berlin Literary Festival. And it's um, a protest against the banning of books and the vicious attack on Rushdie here in New York State, uh, in which he was repeatedly stabbed and almost killed uh, because of religious and political attacks on his literary work and his ideas. The idea of the reading is to stand in solidarity with Rushdie's work and with the right of writers to touch on topics that may offend, may disturb, and to give them that freedom. Not freedom from criticism, not freedom from polemic, but freedom of movement and freedom from physical violence. I'm not going to go into the whole background of who caused Rushdie's work to be uh, subjected to the ban that it originally uh, had and also the encouragement of people to wound or kill him beyond saying what I have already said. It's both political and religious. It doesn't mean that all politics is bad. It doesn't mean all religion is bad, but it means that this kind of politics and this kind of religion is bad. And this kind of religion uh, is in every faith, Jewish, as I am, Christian, Muslim, and Hindu. There's not a limit to where you have a kind of uh, radical um, intolerance that uh, wishes to kill those people uh, whose views uh, offend you. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't any religion free of that. I'm joined by my close friend, Pierre Joris, who has written a long discussion of the Satanic Verses, uh, which was recently published, although it's based on an earlier piece in the Brooklyn Rail. And on the Jacket 2 link, you can go to Pierre's uh, essay and read it, but he's going to read it here for us now. Because these are readings of the Satanic Verse, he and I will both read sections chosen by Pierre, and we'll add that to this video file as two additional sound files on the Jacket 2 page. So be sure to listen to those sound files. Pierre, um, can you give me some background about writing this piece, the origins of it, before you read it? Yes, it's really uh, the double piece. I mean, it was uh, when the recent assassination attempt happened, and uh, I felt the need to, again, state something about uh, the horror of such uh, events and about the fact that Salman Rushdie was subjected to it again. And I remembered that in uh, 89, I had written a piece that I was uh, giving at poetry readings or at universities uh, talking about the satanic verses. So I combined the two, uh, a new, if you want, intro to what was my thinking about uh, the satanic verses and the whole problem that they brought up. Uh, you will hear that um, I, by chance, was present at one of the very first um, public events where uh, Rushdie was um, aggressed verbally only at that time. Uh, but um, the whole follow-up and thinking about this has been with me for a very long time. So I thought it was uh useful to put it out again and you know publish it and make that public stand uh for a fellow writer whose life 
is in danger, which is at this point um, in this country, supposedly something that shouldn't happen. But of course, uh, as you said earlier, religious fanaticism is part of every religion. And in this country, for different reasons, we have similar uh, fascistoid religious um, aggressions happening. And I want to emphasize that in doing this reading, of course, many of the people that will listen to this are already going to be sympathetic to us, but thinking of some imaginary audience that I hope would listen, but may not, um, who is offended by what Rushdie writes. It's not in our view, I can speak for you, that um, that um, the offense is right or wrong. It's our view that writers should be allowed to offend uh, without fear of physical violence against them or imprisonment. Um, and also, it's not our view that this is anything that's specific about Muslim, uh, about the Islamic faith or about Muslims. Absolutely. And it cannot be used to stigmatize that particular religion, uh, which is from, as Pierre and I both just said, for us, similar to the other major religions in, in this potential and the need to resist it. And so I just before you start and then go right into your, your reading after that, it, perhaps you could say something about a book that was very uh, important to me in understanding what I've just said, uh, which was called The Malady of Islam that you uh, translated. Well, that was uh, my friend, Abdul Wahab Medeb, unhappily, he passed a few years back already. And right after 9-11, he wrote immediately uh, in the next three, four months, he wrote a book called The Malady of Islam uh, that try to explain why certain what happened, why that kind of current uh, extremist strain was possible inside a religion and the culture and the philosophy that is much broader, much wider, much more open, that was maybe the most open one uh, for a number of centuries. And as soon as I knew that he was doing this, I decided to translate it right away. And I did that with uh, uh, the help of um, Henri, it was really Charlotte Mandel, uh, and so that we could bring that book out as quickly as possible. Uh, it was, of course, immediately um, when the publisher mentioned it to made it a bit public, all of a sudden there was a request from a right-wing think tank in Washington who wanted to uh, mm. <clears throat> use pages from it and rewrite it a little bit. <laughs> and, you know, so obviously I said, no, no, you can't, you can't do that. And uh, so the malady of Islam, I, we brought it out a year after 9-11, which was as fast as it, it, it was possible. And um, I think it is still, it is, I, it's still available at various places, but it is not really in print anymore. So it's a book that I think should remain in print because it is a very important analysis of Islamic Arab culture. So the Brooklyn Rail, um, in support of uh, the Satanic Verses and Salman Rushdie and their right to uh, speak, uh, rushed into print your essay, uh, and it's in the current issue of the Brooklyn Rail. So please, Pierre, uh, go ahead and, and read that for us. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. So uh, the essay is called For Salman Rushdie and the Satanic Verses, and it opens with a quote by Rushdie. Throughout human history, the apostles of purity, those who have claimed to possess a total explanation, have wrought havoc among mere mixed-up human beings. Last Friday's knife attack on Salman Rushdie was not only appalling, it also shook many of us out of a sort of complacency regarding his situation. 30 plus years after the pronouncement of the Iranian fatwa against the author of the satanic verses, when all the noise and the danger seemed to have died down and Rushdie had been moving around freely and publicly for more than a decade, this assassination attempt 
came as a complete surprise. In this country, at least, Islamic terrorism seemed to have receded behind the Christian fascist terrorism of the various crazed MAGA conspiracy cults. Well, no. We are indeed at a historical moment when the indiscriminate rise of a range of totalitarianisms cannibalistically feeds on itself, or rather on the young, mainly male, gullibles in need of some know of any kind of reassurance, no matter how irrational, spurious, or idiotic, at a moment of impending disaster and planetary crisis. Early that afternoon, I had walked along the Narrows listening to the Belgian philosopher Vincien Desprez on France Culture Radio. When asked about the human need to create stories, she said that it is very important to make up stories, to tell tales, as that means to open possibilities. She then quoted what Virginia Woolf wrote in her journal on January 18, 1915, quote, the future is dark, which is the best thing the future can be, I think, end of quote. The prayer commented thus, yes, dark, and those were dark times indeed, but dark here also means opaque, which means we can't see all the possibilities the future holds. And so the fact that the future is dark also indicates that it holds a lot of possible openings and it falls upon us. We owe it to ourselves to try and create, cultivate and nourish those open possibles rather than, for example, tragic futures. We have that responsibility. And so what we tell of the present and of the past will nourish some open possibility for the future. End of quote. When I came home an hour or so later, the news of the stabbing of Salman Rushdie reached me. And that concept, that idea, that necessity of creating stories to open possibilities for the future that Spray had outlined immediately came to mind because it is exactly what Rushdie's satanic verses had tried to do, no, had done. And it is exactly because he dared to do this that the powers of the fake and blinding light of religious obscurantism vowed to shut him down. Fascism is all about narrowing and closing down the possibilities of rich, meaningful existence which is always an existence not based on any one single source of light as the supposed single truth, but open to viewing, enjoying, and connecting with a multitude of different light points. The stars in the night sky say, or the numberless human and non-human lives we live amidst and meet during our life on this planet. Rushdie's original condemnation was based on the spurious accusation of blasphemy, which, as the punk rock band No Facts once put it, is a victimless crime. Or, as Adam Gopnik recently put it in the New York in response to the stabbing, blasphemy is not a mighty category demanding respect for, but a pitiful invention of those who cannot tolerate having their pet convictions criticized. Outside of the Rushdie condemnation, I had given thought to the concept of blasphemy only in relation to the poet Paul Celan, who in 1960, talking with Nellie Sachs, and after she had indicated that she was a believer, responded that he hoped to be able to blaspheme to the very end, to which she nodded and said, we just don't know what counts. In her Meersburger, prize acceptance speech, Sachs also said explicitly, and I quote, everything counts, everything is ferment, that works. And we, smoking from error, try well or badly, we try again and again, end of quote. For the poet, the writer, the thinker, to blaspheme, always defined by someone else, is one mode of gaining insight into what counts. And for talking to and about the world in our attempt to try and find out what counts for us. Paul Celan's statement thus remains a necessary insight and stance. Poets, writers, artists, citizens of the world, do not let yourselves be silenced by the various fatwas or book burnings, 
orchestrated by power-hungry totalitarian or would-be totalitarian pseudo-leaders. The reason they do this is because they know the danger complex, multi-balanced, open-ended thinking puts their fake claims to authority in. I had hoped that I would never need to bring out what I had written about or rather for Salman Rushdie back in the spring of 1989. But here we are, August 2022. And even if Salman is no longer on a breathing machine and it looks like his life is not in imminent danger from his wound, though we do not yet know of possible sequels, it is important, especially given the political situation in a country playing with the possibility of an authoritarian anti-democratic regime already set on book burnings and racist supremacist terrorism, yes, I mean these not so united states, take over from the imperfect for working in the sense that its workings can be improved by its citizens' actions in the voting booth, democracy it has been. In the fall of 1988 at the Toronto Harbourfront Festival, I witnessed what may have been the first public vocal attack on Salman Rushdie. As he was on stage with some of us other invited writers, and the man in the audience suddenly jumped up and started screaming something against Solomon Rushdie. Rushdie didn't answer for a while, but the man kept repeating his verbal attack until finally Rushdie said that he was not Solomon Rushdie, and the man was ushered out of the amphitheater. It was, if I remember correctly, late September, the very month the Satanic Verses was published. None of us present that evening thought that this was more than an isolated incident, which would of course, which could of course repeat, but we didn't think much more about it until a few months later. On 14th of February 1989 came the Iranian Fatwa, of which he is reminded every year at that date by the Iranian government sending him what he calls an unfunny valentine. Not only had I liked the person, Salman, on the two occasions we met, but the idea of someone being condemned to death because of something he had written was so outrageous that I, living upstate New York at the time, felt I had to do something, at least for the understanding of the book in question. I thus wrote a talk, lecture, including readings of the offensive pages of the Satanic Verses, which I gave on a number of occasions at universities and poets' gatherings during the spring of 89. Here it is, somewhat abbreviated. Tonight, I will talk about and read a few pages from Salman Rushdie's latest novel, The Satanic Verses. There is no way of pretending that this is just another literary shop talk session. Everyone in this room is aware of the context in which we were approaching the satanic verses. It is the context of book burnings in England and elsewhere, of hurt religious feelings, of censorship, of intolerance, of a death sentence against the author pronounced by a foreign head of state, and of people actually dying in the streets in Islamabad in Bombay. Before anything else, I feel therefore the need to make my own stance clear. I am not here tonight primarily as a scholar, critic, or literary commentator. I am here tonight, first of all, as a writer myself, and thus as a colleague of the man sentenced to death for having expressed his thoughts in writing. I am also here tonight as a politically engaged citizen who believes that in matters such as censorship and intolerance, one has to take a stand. Finally, I am here tonight to bear witness for friend Salman Rushdie for whose deep sincerity and honesty, both the man's and the writer's, I have the highest esteem. What I want to talk about concerns several distinct though linked areas. It concerns the satanic verses to a novel, i.e. as a literary artifact. It also concerns the reception of the book and the ideological misuse that is being made of it. The third area has to do with the inevitable shadow this affair and its widespread reporting in the media is bound to cast over the whole of the Muslim world by reinforcing the West's worst prejudices concerning Muslim culture. I will try to link and illustrate these various levels of my talk by selected passages from the Satanic Verses. 
Ideally, I would have preferred to simply read the book. There has been all too much talk about the book, which has not been allowed to speak for itself. And that not only so in those countries that banned it. The Satanic Verses is the third in a series of novels that started with Midnight's Children in 1981 and Shame in 1983. Midnight's Children, which won Rajdi the Booker Prize, was a huge success and brought its also to the forefront of a new generation of British writers, Anglo-Indian in Rajdi's case, as he was born in Bombay and lived there and in Karachi, Pakistan, until he was sent to England at age 14 where he was educated, studied to write, and still lives, albeit under more than strange circumstances right now. It is interesting to note, by the way, that the most powerful renewing energies for British literature in this young generation of British writers emanates from its multicultural constituents, Rushdie for one, but also, say, Timothy Moe, the novelist of Chinese descent, while much energy in recent British poetry has been generated by the Anglo-Caribbean writers. Midnight's Children is a dark, hilarious, politically loaded epic parable of India since independence. Its main character, a Midnight's Child, i.e. someone born at the exact moment when India became independent in 1947, Rajdi's birth year also, goes from the bright hopes of childhood to a disabused, cynical adulthood, a figure functioning somewhat like a metaphor for the country's aspirations as well. The political aspects of that book already caused a furor in India, and Indira Gandhi, who had declared a very undemocratic emergency rule in 1975 and was sharply attacked in the book, actually thought of suing Salman Rushdie. The second book, <coughs> Shame, is set in an imaginary Pakistan, and its politics are even more explicit. Rushdie comes down hard on the military rule of General Muhammad Zia al haq who appears in the novel in the guise of a character called Raza Haider and his use of Islam and Islamic law for repressive purposes. In an episode cited by reviewers both in England and here in the US, a simpering foreign journalist asks Haider if he has a point of view about the allegation that your institution of such Islamic punishments as flogging and the cutting off of hands might be seen in certain quarters as being arguably according to certain definitions, so to speak, barbaric? Haider replies, we will not simply order people to stick out their hands like this and go fatak with a butcher's knife. No, sir. All will be done under the most hygienic conditions with proper medical supervision, use of anesthetic, etc. You will not be surprised to hear that Salman Rushdie was instantly proved right in his evaluation of the Zia regime. The book was banned in Pakistan. The Satanic Verses, which one can easily read as the third volume in a trilogy that is a huge, I would like to say, Vedantic frieze of a multicultural buildings roman, is set for the main part in contemporary England, though framed by a journey from and a journey back to India, and more specifically Bombay. True to his own multi-layered cultural background, Rajdi combines in his novelistic art the narrative techniques of Indian and Arabian storytelling and those techniques and concerns of contemporary Western so-called postmodern fiction. His is, in his own words, a stereoscopic art. Western critics have often labeled him a practitioner of magic realism, as does Michiko Kakutani in her New York Times review of the Satanic Verses, explaining the origin and need for magic realism as follows. It is no coincidence that magic realism, which combines heightened language with elements of the surreal, has tended to flourish in troubled areas of the world, or that many of its practitioners have sought to describe calamitous events that exceed the grasp of normal description. The transactions between the extraordinary and the mundane that occur in so much Latin American fiction are not merely a literary technique, but also mirror, a mirror of a reality in which the fantastic is frequently part of everyday life, a reality in which military death squads have effectively turned to word disappear 
into a transitive verb. But it would be a mistake to assimilate Salman Rushdie completely or exclusively with Latin American or third world magic realism. His multicultural imagination draws on and synthesizes possibilities and modes of expression from a dizzying field of literary inventions. A.G. Moshtabai, writing in the New York Times re book review, tries to explain the book's palimpsest of styles to Western readers unfamiliar with Rushdie's work by saying that in its entirety, it resembles only itself. But there are in its parts strands and shades of resemblance to stern for one in the joy of digression, to swift in scasingness of political satire, to the fairy and folk tales of the Brothers Grimm, to Ovid's Metamorphoses, the Arabian Nights, Thomas Munn's transposed hairs, and to work of Gabriel, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Günther Grass, Thomas Pynchon, John Barth, Italo Calvino, Saturday Night Live, and Douglas Adams's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, to name a few. Indeed, one could add half a dozen of other sources of Rujdi's craft, but I will restrain myself. It is, in fact, this rich splendor of means and materials which is often cited as a criticism of Rajdi's work in that it violates the canons of Western Aristotelian literary decorum. Let's now turn to the novel itself, a brief summary of the main plot line. In the opening of the book, two actors fall from heaven when the 747 Air India jumbo jet en route from Bombay to London is blown up by terrorists. Chibril Farishta is an ailing star of those Indian movies known as theologicals. He has played the role, the whole panoply of Hindu gods, demiurges, and culture heroes, who, after a metaphysical crisis, has gone to earth and is now trying to find Alleluia Cone, an English mountain climber, the only woman to have done the highest Himalayan peak, with whom he has fallen in love. Saladin Shamsha is also an actor, or rather a voice impersonator. He dubs a thousand and one voices for English radio and TV, who is returning to London and his English wife after a short, unpleasant stay in Bombay, the city of his birth. Shamsha is the extreme version of a classical Anglo-Indian figure, the Indian who has only hatred and contempt for his uncivilized country and who tries to be more English than the English. The two men fall in unison from the debris of the jet and magically survive the fall, washing up on the coast of England. But during the fall, they are metamorphosed. Shibril now sprouts a halo while Chamsha is growing horns, goat feet and a goatish hair cover on his body. Chibril is taking on the exterior attributes of his namesake, the Archangel Gabriel, and Chamsha those of Shaitan, Satan. When the English immigration police discovers them, they arrest Chamsha and Jibril does not lift a hand to save him. His betrayal is one of the central themes of the novel. Both men eventually make it to London, where Jibril finds Ali Cohn, tries to restart his cinematographic career, but is continuously battling against and defeated by his mental illness, diagnosed at one point as paranoid schizophrenia, in that his psychotic persona changes from the gentle archangel Jibril into that of Azrael, the exterminating angel. Chamsha finds his English wife has taken a lover, an Indian, an old friend of Saladin's, and is pregnant by him. His career is in ruins. He goes through a formidable identity crisis as he hides out in the bosom of the South London Asian community and finally revenges Jibril's betrayal by ruining the letter's relation with Ali Cohn. The last chapter of the novel finds both men back in India, Chamsha at the side of his dying father and rediscovering and accepting his Indian roots, just as he rediscovers his first love. Jibril to play out the last act of his demented career. This little plot summary, however, belies the complexity of a novel overflowing with subplots and sub subplots. Most of these emerge as what the book calls the serial dreams and ravings from the demented mind of Jibril Azrael, and one of them taking up exactly 67 pages of the 547 pages of the book 
concerns the visionary prophet founder of the new religion. But before we try to approach this, the most contentious section of the book, let me read you a couple pages from the opening chapter, which you will have an uh, audio recording read by Charles, so that you may get a sense of Rushdie's style. Now, in those early pages, there is already a foreboding of the satanic verses of the title. Jibril seems to hear Rekha Merchant. We will learn later, later on that she is his rejected mistress who committed suicide by throwing herself and her children out of a Bombay high-rise and will haunt him on her Bokhara flying carpet throughout the book, singing verses related to Al-Lat. Al-Lat was one of the pre-Islamic goddesses of Mecca, in fact, the most powerful one, a kind of earth mother goddess figure and the patron deity of Mecca, who is overthrown by monotheistic Islam. This has landed us in the heart of the most contentious chapters, the ones for which Salman Rushdie has been accused of blasphemy. They tell the story, and by the way, Rushdie is very careful throughout the book to point to the fictional nature of his creations, as shows the often repeated formula Kan ma kan fi kadim azaman. It was so, it was not, in a time long forgot, which is the equivalent of our Western once upon a time of a visionary prophet who found a new religion in a desert city made out of sand called Jahiliya, which is an Arabic word meaning darkness, ignorance, and used to refer to the times before Islam, i.e. before the light of enlightenment, which the prophet brought. Jahiliya corresponds to our Western use of the term the Dark Ages. Now, there is no doubt that the fiction represents the story of the foundation of Islam, that Mahun is and is not, as the formula has it, the Prophet Muhammad. It is these chapters that were declared blasphemous by fundamentalists months before Khomeini jumped on the bandwagon and upped the ante. I will later try to show that what lies below the religious clamor is in each and every case political manipulation. But for the time being, let's look at the religious aspects. First of all, I would like to say that for me, freedom of speech includes the freedom to blaspheme. In fact, blasphemy is simply a term for condemning someone else's opinion by appealing to an absolute arbiter, a transcendent truth that may not be questioned under penalty of death. My own tradition, the Christian one, is strewn with the corpses of blasphemers. But let's pretend for a moment that blasphemy is a valid concept. How does Rajdi's novel blaspheme? The fundamentalists' objections seem to revolve around five essential points. First of all, there is the name of the fictionalized visionary prophet, Mahund. This name was used in medieval times in Christian literature passion plays and the like, to refer to a demon or devil, and philologically seems to be a conflation of Muhammad and hound, as in hounds of hell. Rushdie acknowledges that his name was used in a derogatory way once upon a time, but he says, quote, my novel tries in all ways to reoccupy negative images, to repossess pejorative language. And on page 93, he explains, quote, to turn insults into strengths, Whigs, Tories, Blacks, all chose to wear with pride the names they were given in scorn. Likewise, our mountain-climbing, profit-motivated solitary is to be Mahoon. End of quote. The very fact that the novelist enters his fiction at this point to include this explanation in the book shows how careful he was to avoid any misinterpretation of the blasphemy type. Another bone of religious contention is the novel's title, The Satanic Verses. A direct reference is to a story according to which, at an early point in Muhammad's career, he received verses that accepted three Meccan goddesses, among them Allah, into Islam as female intercessionary archangels, in an effort not to put off the polytheistic citizens of Mecca at the moment when he and his few companions were as yet powerless. Later, the archangel Gabriel told Muhammad that these verses had been satanic verses, falsely inspired by the devil in disguise, and they were removed from the Quran. 
But Rushdie's use of that story cannot, even theologically, be given as blasphemy. It is, in fact, recorded by early Islamic historians and foremost by Al-Tabari, one of the canonical Islamic commentators. Only a frightened and thus intolerant fundamentalist version of Islam will call this use of the story blasphemy. As Rashi says in an article published after the first public burnings of the satanic verses in England, quote, Gabriel consoled Muhammad. However, earlier prophets had experienced similar difficulties for similar reasons, he said. To my mind, Muhammad's ever coming of temptation does seem no dishonor. Quite the reverse. The Archangel Gabriel felt the same way, but the novel's opponents are less tolerant than archangels. End of quote. Later Islamic commentators expunged, not to say censored, this tradition from the canon in an effort to make Muhammad appear as a perfect being. And it is exactly here that a theological battle could indeed arise. Islam has always insisted that the Prophet Muhammad was a man in opposition and clear contradistinction to Christianity's basic claim that its prophet, Jesus, was in fact God. But these satanic verses refer not only to this Islamic story. In the novel's palimpsest, they also, and Sempuri, refer to the doggerel insinuating that Ali Khan is unfaithful, which Chamsha makes up and mutters over the telephone to Jibril, thus ruining the one relationship that may have saved Farijda's sanity and extracting vengeance for the early betrayal. The novel is clear about the fact that it is Chamcha's doggerel that constitutes the real evil satanic verses. But to my mind, the most scurrilous attack on the book is the one that claims that Salman Rushdie presents the prophet's wives as whores. What in fact happens is that in the Jahilian brothel, Twelve whores take on the personas of Mahun's wives as a business stratagem when they notice that their customers, the grumbling men of Mecca, are fascinated, obsessed with Mahun's real life, but invisible wives. Except for the very moving death scene of Mahun, where Aisha appears, Mahun's wives do not appear in the book, nor are they in any way attacked or sullied. The brothel scene is indeed highly irreverent deeply Rabelaisian, but it is not a scene that could by any stretch of the imagination be constructed as theologically blasphemous. In fact, what this accusation seems to be an alibi for is a dislike, not to say hatred, of reactionary Muslims for Rajdi's clear critique of Islam's treatment of women. There is a militant feminist aspect to his writing that is indeed bound to upset traditionalists. More interesting is the question of the nature of the word and of writing. According to Islamic tradition, the Quran is the word of God, dictated by the archangel Jibril through the prophet Muhammad and set down immaculately by the prophet's scribes. In Rajdi's fiction, we are introduced to one of these scribes, Salman the Persian. This, by the way, shows one of the novel's many palimpsestic qualities, or in the Nasa language, the polysemic play of the signifier. Salman, the scribe, is and is not Salman Firazi, the actual historical figure, a companion of the prophet, just as he is and is not a fictional invention by the novelist, just as he is and is not the novelist himself through the coincidence of their first names and their similar occupations as scribes, writers. In the novel, Salman the scribe develops doubts about the godly origin of the transmission and tries to test the prophet by changing words and sentences. You'll hear a section of that story in the audio files. And it will, I think, become clear that what Rushdie is doing in his fiction is to honestly put forward the doubts and questions any man or woman who is not an unconditional fanatic believer will entertain at one or another moment of his or her life. Here is the context. Mahund, on his way back to conquer Jahiliya, where Baal, the poet, who 25 years earlier, on the instigation of a Meccan grandee, had written a vicious satire on the prophet, is returning home. Now a written-out, bloated, middle-aged man, full of fear, finds Salman, the Persian scribe, hiding out in his room. And that's where that second audio file begins. 
Later on in this chapter, the prophet will deal much more kindly and generously with the doubting scribe than the ayatollah with the novelist. In fact, and in contrast to the screams of blasphemy, Rushdie's prophet visionary emerges in a very positive light. The novel's thrust is not blind or vicious attack on religion. As Rushdie puts it himself, quote, the Satanic Verses is not, in my view, an anti-religious novel. It is, however, an attempt to write about migration, its stresses and transformations from the point of view of migrants from the Indian subcontinent to Britain. This is, for me, the saddest irony of all, that after working for five years to give voice and fictional flesh to the immigrant culture of which I am myself a member, I should see my book burned, largely unread, by the people is about, people who might find some pleasure and much recognition in its pages. I try to write against stereotypes. The zealot protests serve to confirm in the Western mind all the worst stereotypes of the Muslim world. End of quote. The South African novelist Nadine Godima picks this up when in her review of the book she writes that, quote, Anyone who actually has read this highly complex, brilliant novel knows that dominant among its luxuriant theme is that of displacement. Muhammad and the Muslim face are the novelist's metaphors for, among other human dilemmas, spiritual displacement in the colonial experience. The dark light, the darkest pages in the novel concern political abuse of religion. For Rajdi's aim is not to attack religion or the origins of Islam, but to expose political excesses in our own days. The major part of the novel and its essential themes are set in London's Asian emigre community. And the enemy in Rajdi's eyes is racism and Thatcherite England. It is an incredible, bitter irony that right now it is Thatcher and the English police whom Rushdie loathes and reviles here and elsewhere, who are by circumstance forced to protect the novelist trying to save his life. A bitter irony, if only because Rushdie sees the job of the writer in such political terms. As he has written elsewhere, quote, it seems to me imperative that literature enter such arguments because what is being disputed is nothing less than what is the case what is truth and what untruth, and the battlegrounds is our imagination. If writers leave the business of making pictures of the world to politicians, it will be one of history's great and most abject abdications. There is a genuine need for political fiction, for books that draw new and better maps of reality and make new languages with which we can understand the world. It is necessary to grapple with the special problems created by the incorporation of political material because politics is by turns farce and tragedy and sometimes, for example, Zia's Pakistan, both at once. End of quote. This political dimension has always been an essential aspect of Rushdie's fiction and his analysis of the use of religious fervor for political ends precedes the recent events by several years. Quote again, autocratic regimes find it useful to espouse the rhetoric of faith because people respect that language, are reluctant to oppose it. This is how religions show up dictators, by encircling them with words of power, words which the people are reluctant to see discredited, disenfranchised, mocked. End of quote. Those words were prophetic, for that is the exact misuse made of the satanic verses. Let's quickly recapitulate the history of that misuse. The satanic verses came out in England early last fall, i.e. in September 1988, and October 5th, his native country, India, decided to ban the book, a ban imposed later also by Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, of all places, and belatedly, but all the more effectively, Iran. The political motives for the banning were from the first obvious. As Amir Mufti explains it in the Village Voice, quote, Rajiv Gandhi's government apparently used the book to calm a religious conflict in northern India concerning a structure that Muslims believe is a mosque 
what that Hindu group say is the birthplace of the Lord God Rama, end of quote. In India, about 11% of whose population is Muslim, the novel became, and I quote Mufti again, another shouting match between Indian Muslims and the country's anglicized, largely Hindu ruling class. The Muslim legislators who repeatedly met with the Home Minister to urge a ban represented every major political group in which Muslims are represented, including the ruling Congress party, the national opposition Janata party, and the sectarian Muslim League. By September, the Barbary Majiv Coordinating Committee, a Muslim political group led by opposition parliamentarian Siad Shahabuddin, has had decided to stage a march to the mosque birthplace after Friday prayers on October 14th. Hindu groups let it be known that they might go along as well. The Home Minister and other officials try to convince Muslim leaders to cancel the march. It is difficult to believe that after several meetings, understanding was not reached. On October 5th, the government announced its ban on the satanic verses. On October 12th, Shah Abedin announced an indefinite postponement of the march. End of quote. In Pakistan, the situation was even clearer. With the election of Benazir Bhutto, a westernized female in the eyes of the Islamic fundamentalists who were the major losers of the elections, anything that could galvanize the religious fervor of the people was useful. Thus, it was that the announcement of the American publication of the Satanic Verses was immediately exploited by the fundamentalists, resulting in the storming of the U.S. Cultural Center and the ensuing death. Ironically, and contrary to some misleading reporting, Rajdi is no great friend of Benazir Bhutto's. On a purely political level, the opposition to Bhutto could very well have used this, his devastating review of her hagiographic biography of her father, Ali Bhutto, as a weapon against her. But religious fanaticism and the lives sacrificed on its altar are much more powerful weapons than political arguments. We don't have the time to go into the details of other bannings or into the exact political stratagems behind the book burnings in England. In fact, at this point, I would like to focus elsewhere and discuss the shadow of these events have thrown over the Islamic world. The dangerous fact is that the shortcuts and ideological conditionings of the Western press and TV, through which we get our information concerning all these events, inevitably tend to present the events surrounding the Rushdie affair in a context where an enlightened, tolerant, democratic West, that was between quotes, is pitched against an obscurantist, zealot, reactionary, intolerant, East, Orient, Islamic world, end quote. This is a false view and can only lead to a deepening of the prejudices already harbored in the West concerning the Islamic countries and the rest of the third world. I finished rereading the novel and heard about the first Iranian reactions in the town of Mani in the Yucatan, the town infamous as the site where Fray Diego de Landa, a Spanish Franciscan zealot, burnt nearly all the books and documents of the Mayan civilization. In a way, this put the current book burnings and the ensuing death sentence in perspective, while simultaneously making them even more saddening. If you study history carefully, you will discover that the West, especially in its Christian garb, has a far worse track record for intolerance, zealotry, and mindless destruction of human beings and their creations than the Islamic world. With relatively few exceptions, tolerance in literary matters and even in religious matters has in fact been a hallmark of Islamic culture from the days of the Prophet to today. Let's note that, except for the aforementioned countries, the major part of the Muslim world, for example, Indonesia, the most populated Muslim country, or the countries of the Maghreb, has not reacted with the hysteria reported in the Western press. Contemporary examples of books that are, if not more, blasphematory than the satanic verses are also worth mentioning. Let me cite just one. The Hadith of Abu Huraira by the Tunisian writer Mahmoud Mesadi written in the 50s, published in the 60s, well-known and read not only in the Maghreb, but also in the Mashrek. The novel 
has been praised by the likes of Taha Hussein and is taught in the official school curriculum in Tunisia. This book uses the form of the hadith, i.e. of the sayings of the prophet, and has as its main character Abu Huraira, a close companion of the prophet and the transmitter of the majority of the hadith. The novel draws heavily on such decadent Western thinkers like Nietzsche. The title could in fact be translated as Thus Spoke Abu Huraira, so that would be overdetermining it, and other contemporary existentialist philosophers. Abu Huraira, in Islamic terms, is clearly a mulhid, an atheist, who in one scene, for example, is seen fornicating in the Kaaba, the most holy place in Islam, and who attempts to demonstrate the futility of religion throughout the book. What I want to say with these examples is that what we are seeing now is a degeneration, a misuse of religion for political purposes, and that we should be careful not to make the mistake of taking these local reactions as the baseline of all Islamic or Arabic culture. Ayatollah Khomeini's reaction fits exactly what Rushdie said above about the misuse of religion for political purposes. Not only is he using religious feeling to shore up the ruins of his reign and to find himself again in the forefront of revolutionary Islam after a decade of Iraq-Iran war had tarnished that image and started forces inside Iran endangering his vision of where the country should go. But also, the suppression of the satanic verses on religious ground serves to hide the real reasons for that suppression, which is strictly political. There will be another extract read, and you will uh, hear what I mean by that last uh, quote. So this is what I wrote in 89, right after um, the fatwa came down. Today, we are September 20th, 22. I just wish Salman good recovery and many more books. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pierre, for that uh, comprehensive and insightful and powerful presentation on this difficult topic in a way shouldn't be difficult but it's difficult both at an emotional level in terms of what happened to this person in new york state uh you know where we both lived for so long at a at a place that was dedicated to reconciliation and open conversation within a christian context but by, by the way um and uh a, a terrible insult to um to the Christian uh, people of good faith who came to that place. So we could see an attack on, you know, many, many different things. Uh, please uh, listen to the book in our audio recordings uh, for which you'll find a link on the Jacket 2 page. Um, and once again, thank you so much, Pierre. Thank you, Charles.